learning how to read is invaluable. It's probably something that most drummers can't do, or and most drummers can't do well, that's for sure. But most drummers don't even think about learning how to read past your very basics. Hey guys, this is Cam Can Drum. I'm coming to you from my backyard because it's such a beautiful day. It's about 72 degrees here in uh, the suburbs of Philadelphia. And I thought, you know, this is probably going to be a logistical nightmare, seeing as though right outside my backyard, there's a highway and there's probably going to be all this noise. And I don't have a lavalier mic. I don't have a shotgun mic. What I'm trying to do is I've got my uh, voice memo on my iPhone and I've got the uh, GoPro audio mic. And then I'm not really counting on any of the Sony, my Sony camera way back there, any of that audio. But I'm just going to talk a little bit louder than I normally do and hope for the best and hope that, uh, you know, since it's already a little bit past rush hour time, that the cars will be few and far between. So bear with me. There's also light spewing between the trees. The trees are moving around. So you might see some focus issues going on. There's leaves falling as well. So <laughs> I thought all of that bad stuff might be worth it just to get the uh, the shot of outside and how beautiful it is out here right now but in any case i want to bring to you lesson three in my series that i think i'm going to call something along the lines of lessons for the groove drummer the drummer that's not looking to get really technical and showy and use a lot of chops i'm more of a space drummer i like to have a lot of space and a lot of openness in my playing and kind of lend myself more to the music as opposed to showing how good of a drummer I am technically. So I haven't really refined it. I have a couple of ideas of what I'm gonna call this, but for now it's, it's kind of like a lessons for the, uh, for the groove drummer. And this is lesson three, and I'm gonna be talking about the importance of why learning to read music is important for all drummers. Before I do so, I gotta do my due diligence. Please subscribe if you haven't. Like this video, share it, click that notification bell, and uh, let all your friends know if you like this channel. I know there's tons of channels that are out there that cater to the more technical side of drums and how to build up your chops and become a better drummer technically. But there's not very many drummers out there that are doing lessons more on how to groove and how to be a good bandmate, a good drummer in the sense of laying down that foundation so that all the other instruments that are playing to you have a good foundation, are, are feeling good within themselves, and are able to just groove with the music. So hopefully my channel adds a little bit more content to that and a little value into making you more of a well-rounded drummer. Technical stuff, obviously very important, but also very important is how you groove with the music and with the musicians that you're playing with. So let's dive into this one. Why learning to read music is so important for drummers. As you can see, I have my iPad out here because I don't wanna leave anything out. I made a presentation. I'm going to put a link in the description to this presentation so that you have all the bullet points that I'm talking about right here. First thing, I want to put out a disclaimer. So gone are the days where I can read music like I can read a book. When I was in jazz class in high school, I was able to sight read. I was able to read a chart, not just a, a drum chart, but also a music chart, whether it be bass, piano, or any one of the, um, the instruments that were in jazz band, whether it be the trumpets, the trombones or the saxophones and I could sight read and you had to sight read in order to be, to be in the jazz band. Sight reading enabled us to not only know what was coming up in the music and, and you know each part of the song but also when to accent the leads whether it be the trumpet lead or the saxophone lead or even the guitar lead. Anytime you can accent those leads in jazz makes you so much better of a drummer. It makes the song, makes the music seems so much more together because you all know exactly what's going on, where to hit when someone goes dan, 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 and stupid things like that. So sight reading is super important and it was something that I had to do when I was in jazz band. But once I got out of jazz band and we were playing, I was playing in rock bands and we were basically writing stuff in the studio together and it wasn't like I was coming into a new band and I had to learn new music and all that. We were writing it together, there was no real need to learn how to read. After, geez, maybe six or seven months of me not reading, I kind of lost that ability. Now, of course, if I really wanted to, I could jump back into it and really try to learn and get my learning skills up, uh, reading skills up again. But being older, it's a lot harder to get into something like 
reading music or learning a new language or pretty much anything. When you're older, it's a lot harder to do. So this is geared especially towards drummers that are just starting, that are have this completely new field in front of you and you want to learn as much as possible. It doesn't matter if you're young or old. When you get into something new, you just kind of want to soak it all up. I think before you do anything, before you even pick up a pair of sticks, try learning how to read. See how far you can get. Learning how to read is invaluable. It's probably something that most drummers can't do, or and most drummers can't do well, that's for sure. But most drummers don't even think about learning how to read past your very basics. So the more you can read, the better off you'll be. But even just a little bit of reading is going to elevate your skills and a lot of other things in your drumming career as you go along the lines. I basically have five reasons why you should learn how to read music. And they're all in here in this presentation. So number one is the importance of reading. Why is it important? And why is it important to sight read? Not just learn how to read music, but to sight read. Sight read means like reading a book. You can read it as fast as you possibly can, as, as fast as you're talking, as fast as you're communicating. You can put down a chart and read it as if you're reading a book. That's what sight reading, reading is called. If you can get to that level, you are head, shoulders, knees and toes above every other drummer. There are so few drummers that can sight read that the opportunities are just wide open for you. It could be the difference between getting a gig and losing a gig. That's how important reading is at any level. If you can read even just a little bit, you have more opportunities. If you can read well, you have even more opportunities. And if you can sight read, the sky's the limit. You can basically, you have the advantage over most other drummers, 90 to 95% of other drummers out there. It's equivalent to having a master's or a doctorate or a cert, cert, cert uh, can't talk, a certification in some very advanced field, like maybe electronics or something like that. Engineering, those types of high level learning, learning how to read, is the equivalent, the equivalent of those types of degrees. I actually lost gigs and didn't audition for gigs because I knew that there was gonna be some sort of reading required for those gigs, whether it be auditioning for a cover band. Cover bands, you know, you have all types of music and at the drop of a hat, you're gonna to have to be able to play a song if someone requests it in the audience. If you know how to read, you can do that. If you don't know how to read, you're relying on your memory on how these songs go. Sometimes cover bands have 200 to 300 songs in their category, and you have to remember all those songs. If you know how to sight read, you don't have to remember anything. Just put that chart up and start playing. There goes the motorcycle. So reading is super important, and you know that's my number one reason to learn how to read because it just opens up your opportunities a million fold. And I actually even, I'm gonna plug my newest design at my merch shop over on Teespring. I'll put a link in the description. I made a design that says reading is important. A little pun. It's a typo. It's fun. Hopefully you guys like it. Hopefully you maybe want to buy a shirt or a mug or maybe even a face mask or whatever. It's all available on my Teespring. Link in the description. Let's go on to number two, knowing the basics. The basics of knowing how to read music is vitally important. If you can get the basics down, as I said before, you're already ahead of the game. The basics are knowing the chart, whether it's a musical chart or a drum chart, being able to see it and instantly know, okay, I'm dealing with a music chart or I'm dealing with a drum chart. And in order to do that, you need to see and understand the parts of the chart. For instance, the staff. The staff are those lines that you see on any music chart. That's gonna be on every chart, is the staff. I think one clue that will guide you to see whether or not it's a drum chart is the clef. So there's the treble clef and the bass clef. The treble clef will usually signify that it's a music chart because the treble clef deals with melodies that are in the mid to upper range of notes. Those include piano, guitar, a lot of the voices in different instruments like saxophone, trumpet, and whatnot in, in bigger bands. So the treble clef, when you see it, will usually mean that it's a music chart. When you see the bass clef, it's only gonna be one or two things, one of two things. It's gonna be the bass or it's gonna be the drums. Basically the rhythm section of any band or musical act or whatnot. That's gonna be a, a, the, the first indicator as to whether or not you're dealing with a music chart or a rhythm section chart. Bass clef is, is your first indicator. Any clef is gonna be to the most left of the staff. Time signature and tempo. 
Those are really important. Your time signature is gonna be a fraction to the right of your clef, whether it be four over four, three over four, six over eight, seven over four. There's a bunch of different time signatures that I'm sure most of you guys already know, but it's gonna be indicated on the chart. The tempo will be above the staff, depending on how the beat's counted, whether it's an eighth note or a quarter note, you usually have a quarter note and the tempo right next to it. 60, 80, 98, 120, these are all standard tempos. 128, 140. Pretty much, if you take the song, I don't remember the, the title of the, of the song, but it's, it's, a, it's an old American wartime song. That is in 120. 120 is actually twice the speed of 60. 60 and we go beats per minute. So 60 beats per minute is actually one second on your watch. If you see an old watch with a second hand, every time it clicks down, that's one second, that's 60 beats per minute. It's the same thing. 60 beats per minute equals one second of time. 120 is twice that speed. So you can kind of gauge tempos if you don't have a metronome. Obviously a metronome is the best way to figure out a tempo. But if you don't have a metronome handy, you're at a gig and you're going off the fly and you know that a song is at a certain tempo, you can say, okay, you can gauge 120 and 60. And if it's somewhere in between, you can kind of guess where that tempo is gonna be. So tempo, time signature, the clef and the staff, those are all things that you should know when starting to learn how to read music. Another thing you need to know is a measure. That will coincide with, that. Uh, it'll coordinate with your time signature. So let's say just for simplicity's sake, four over four, which is about 90% of music. Anyway, it's four over four. What does four over four mean? The top four means how many counts are in one measure. The bottom four is what you're measuring. So if it's a four, it's quarter notes. Four on top means four quarter notes for one measure. So you're gonna hit one, two, three, four, and then the next measure is gonna ha happen and it's gonna start the count over again. So in two measures, you're gonna go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And usually how drummers count is they'll count per measure. So the measure that you're counting is the first number of each count. So if you're counting four measures, it's one, two, three, four, two, two, three, four, three, two, three, four, four, two, three, four. And you're doing this in your head so you, you know how many measures have gone by. And usually when you're able to read music, you can go from section to section and you can count how many measures are in that section and then you know the next section is coming up. So if there's a verse that's 16 measures, you can count up to 16 and know that a change is coming. Probably gonna have to you do a fill or at least a signpost on the crash or whatnot. And those are a few hints as to how you can use measures when reading music. Another thing that's important is dynamics. So at any given point, usually dynamics are noted on the bottom of the staff. Let's say your first marker is F. F means forte, means loud. P means piano, means quiet. So there's different terms to signify loud, quiet, and everything in between. So that's basically probably gonna be your first marker is to, to say the song is starting quiet or it's starting loud. If you're starting quiet and you need to go louder, it's gonna say crescendo, which means at that point where it starts crescendoing, you need to start playing louder. And dim, diminuendo means to get quieter. So if you're playing at a medium or a loud dynamic and it says diminuendo, that means to get quieter. So dynamics are also something that you really need to pay attention to when you're reading music. So those are different things that you would find around the staff. What you would find in the staff are the actual notes. So that's my next point is knowing the note. There's three parts to a note. There's the head, the dot part that everyone's familiar with. There is the stem, the line that connects to the head. And then there will either be just the stem for a quarter note. Let me backtrack. No stem, there's a solid head for, I believe it's the whole note, and then an open head for the half note. Stem goes for quarter notes, and anything attached to the stem is less than a quarter note. So you'll either have a flag, or you'll have what some people call a bar, other people call a beam. One bar or beam usually signifies an eighth note, and it's usually connected to another eighth note. If it's just one flag, that's an eighth note by itself. Two flags, is a 16th note by itself. Two bars or beams is a 16th note usually connected to another 16th note. 
that goes a lot further and a, into a lot more detail, but those are the basics. And the last basic I wanna talk about with the note is your dotted note. So a dotted note makes it even more complicated. Trust me, the more you familiarize yourself, the more it starts to become second nature, muscle memory. It becomes less you trying to figure it out in your brain, calculating all these things, and more of just happenstance and, and something that comes naturally. So a dotted note, for instance, a dotted quarter note is the length of a quarter note plus half of that length. So what's half of a quarter note? An eighth note. So it's basically, if you do the math and do the, the fractions, it's three eighths of the time of one measure. And the last thing I want to talk about is rests. Rests are the silence that occurs in music. Notes are for sounds, rests are for silence. You have separate symbols for your rest as you do for your notes. You'll have a note, and you'll have a rest, you'll have a symbol for quarter note rest, whole note, half note, eighth notes, sixteenth notes, thirty second notes, and rests are different symbols than notes. Those are things that you have to, you know, keep in mind. I know I'm throwing a lot of information at you right now, but it's all because when I first started teaching, I tell my students the very first day, I'm gonna throw all of this information at you. You're not gonna understand 95% of it. But later on, as we're dissecting each part of the drum in each lesson, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's right. You talked about it, that in the first lesson. And it all kind of comes full circle and you're able to connect the dots. So right now, it might sound like a lot, but the more you practice reading, the better off you'll be because you'll understand all these terms that are kind of, in any, any other case, that would be coming out of left field and you wouldn't really know what to do with them. So that's number two. Number three is having the right resources, okay? Books, websites, YouTube, apps, those are all really great resources. Let's start with books. I only grew up with two books. I know there's a ton of books out there. There's probably a lot that I should have read when I was younger. Hopefully I get to a point where I can read them at some point. But the two books that stood out to me that really helped me in my playing. One was Ted Reed's Syncopation. Now the title is this really long title, but all drummers know it as the Syncopation book. And basically what Syncopation is, is stressing and emphasizing, thank you truck, the upbeats of whatever phrase that you're playing. So usually most musicians are focused on the downbeat and it comes naturally to basically everybody. When you're nodding your head, clapping your hands, those are usually on downbeats. But for us drummers, we've got to be focused on more than just the downbeat. So this syncopation helps you with being focused and learning how to accent things on the upbeat. Some amazing exercises that will get you used to the unnatural feel of playing on the upbeat. I uh, highly recommend it. I have a link, a link to that book and all the books and all the resources in the description as well as on my website. So check those out. Book number two is George Lawrence Stone's Stick Control. And the reason why I really like this book is because there are exercises that we all can do that feel natural to us. Whether it be rudiments or just playing beats on the drum beat, certain things that just kind of feel right, feel natural. This book goes through so many different exercises and it, when you first do some of these exercises, it feels unnatural. It feels like very foreign. That's the intent of the book. Just because it feels foreign at first doesn't mean it's gonna feel foreign when you keep practicing it. As long as you keep practicing and practicing all the, the different exercises that feel unnatural to you, the more they all start to feel second nature and natural and you'll be able to do things that you wouldn't normally do under natural playing circumstances. I know just as an example that when I first started playing, rock came natural to me. So anytime I got behind a drum set, I would just play rock. I would never try to swing or funk or groove a beat that I was playing because it didn't feel completely natural to me. When I started using stick control, I was able to do things within funk and jazz and other grooves, shuffles included, that I wasn't able to do before. So that book helped me out tremendously. And those are two books that I highly, highly recommend. If you have books that you think I should probably check out, please put a, a comment in the comment section. I need to have more books in my life. So if you have any recommendations, please let me know. But those are the two books that I highly recommend. And there's also websites and a bunch of other things that I'm gonna get into. First website, paramount to probably any other resource is Vic First 40 Essential Rudiments. It features John Wooten on the snare drum and he goes through all the rudiments. There's videos of him playing slow, fast, 
flow. And that helps me out to see somebody playing these rudiments like paradiddles, something super boring and turning it into something completely mind blowing and making me want to do the same thing that he can do, which is play it slow, go faster and faster and faster and start to roll these rudiments, these the paradiddles, and it all sound even and seamless. So I made it a goal to try to do as many of these rudiments as, as I possibly could, as well as Mr. Wooten. Obviously, I'm not anywhere near as good as him, but it's because of him that I got better. And it's because of that website that I got better as a drummer. I didn't start with rudiments. Probably the first, I don't know, maybe five or six years that I played, I was playing in punk bands, I was playing in jazz and kind of getting by just by natural ability. But when I started really doing some heavy recording in the studio, I really needed to get on those rudiments to elevate my playing. And that website really helped me out a lot. The other website I want to bring to light, which I'm not a huge fan of these guys, but I can't deny what they've done to the drum, for the drum community, and that's Drumio. On Drumio's website, they have a bunch of free resources that you can access as a drummer, really good for beginners, as well as their YouTube channel. They have some amazing drummers on there, and what I said earlier, most of the things on YouTube and online uh, cater to the drummer that wants to be the real technical drummer, the one that can do all of these crazy licks and, uh, for lack of a better term, show off. And there's nothing wrong with showing off if you have the chops and you have the ability. But for me, I like to dial it back. Even though, you know, I have a handful of tricks in my trick bag that I like to pull out once in a while, it's not all the time. I'm not that type of drummer. I always like to focus on the groove part of the music. But in any case, Drumio has some really great assets. Even me as a, fan, as, as a non-fan can't deny it. Especially their video that features Thomas Pridgen and how he associates rudiments on the drum set. I thought that was a very valuable lesson that Thomas did. I recommend that video and I put a link in, this, in the description for that, so check that out. And I also have to give a uh, shout out to two of my uh, YouTube buddies that actually do a lot of lessons on YouTube and I think are very valuable and you can gain a lot of insight and a lot of different exercises that you probably wouldn't find anywhere else. One is Whelan Drums. He's a guy from Ireland that I think came over to the United States. He has some really cool stuff on his channel. And the other is Masa the Machine. He's in Japan and he does some really awesome things on the drum set and uh, diagrams them all out. Those are two websites that I recommend you check out if you want to learn how to play the drums and excel at the drums. Some really good exercises for you to find there. Lastly, I want to get into apps. There's a few apps that are out there that allow you to write music, not only music, but also drum scores. The one that I use, because I'm lucky enough to uh, be a co-producer and the video editor, Thanks, motorcycle, uh, of, a, of a website, or sorry, a YouTube channel called Audio Epidemic, where my buddy talks about guitar stuff. He has a subscription to Guitar Pro, and I am on that subscription, and Guitar Pro, you're able to also write drum scores. So I use that. It is kind of pricey. It's 70 bucks, but you can basically do almost anything on that software. If you don't want to spend that kind of money, I recommend the Aerodrums Arid software which I think is more of kind of like a donation. It's like four bucks if you wanted to donate and you can donate more and you can download that software where you can write drum scores. And then there's two that are free that are, I think, light versions and then you can have a paid version that's anywhere between, I think, 30 and 60 bucks or whatever. One is MuseScore. I actually downloaded that one and, and toyed around with it a little bit. Not bad, not the same level as Guitar Pro, obviously, but, um, you know, it's a light version, it's free, you can do most of the basics. And the other one is Crescendo. Same thing. Crescendo has a light version and then a paid version. It's okay, probably the least effective of those four, but you can get things done on it. And it, I think it's more geared towards PC, whereas I'm more of a, a Mac person. So if you're a PC person, that might be the one for you. So those are four apps. Uh, again, if you guys have any recommendations or whatnot for books, websites, YouTube channels, apps, Put them in the, uh, the comment section and I'll, uh, I'll definitely check them out. And hopefully other people watching will also check them out. Number four, I know it's taking a little bit longer than I would hope, but I really want to kind of dive into why music is so important. 
Number four is being able to have the right mindset. Even a little bit of reading is better than no reading at all, as I said in the beginning. With that mindset of being able to read, even just a little bit, even if you took, if you were able to take a chart home, for instance, and learn the song on your own time, being able to read it and know what it says when you go into the studio or you go on the stage the next day, you have a reference and you have a lot more confidence in being able to perform that song to the ability that the band needs you to. Having that kind of confidence and that mentality is so beneficial to your playing. Even just to have a little bit, like if you, you have the, the old guys that type, right? They type one finger at a time, but eventually they'll get there. And it's the same thing with learning. My daughter is at the window. It's the same thing with learning how to read. If you can only read one note at a time, eventually you'll get there. And as long as you're willing to put the time into reading and figuring out the song, when you actually play it and you have your chops up, you can play that song all the way through the very first time. So having the right mindset. If you make this effort to learn how to read, keep the effort. Don't be like me. Practice. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do. Okay? Learn, if you learn how to read, it's almost like winning the lottery, right? You have accumulated all this wealth. Of course, you want to spend some of it, but you also want to keep a bulk of that wealth. Because if you keep your assets and you keep working on reading, it's only gonna, it's gonna stick with you. It's gonna stay with you. If you stop reading, if you don't practice it, take my word for it, it's gonna disappear. It's like learning a new language. If you don't have anyone to talk and speak that language with, it disappears. I took a year and a half of Chinese. I could write it, I can speak it, and I can read, but I didn't have anyone to converse with. And then after about six months, I completely forgot everything that I learned. I even wrote Chinese down, took a picture of it, posted it on Facebook and then a year later Facebook you know did that reminder thing oh you posted this a year ago and I tried to read it I couldn't read anything I, I f literally forgot everything and it's the same thing with learning how to read music spend all this time learning how to read music use it keep practicing keep reading because if you don't it'll be gone number five are my tips uh, basically it's kind of like a review of everything that we talked about but I want to stress in every lesson, not just this lesson, but every lesson, that there's no one right way to do things. I think if you have that mentality as a drummer, you're gonna be better off. Case in point, if you look at the time signature and you see three, four, in your head, that might actually be six, eight, depending on how you count the song. Three, four, and six, eight are the same. Mathematically, six, eight reduced to its low and common denominator is three, four. Just because you feel the song in six, eight, that doesn't mean it's only 6-8 and it should say 6-8 on, the, on the, the, the music sheet. The composer feels it in 3-4. It's the way that he feels. So if you see a 3-4 there but you count it as 6-8, it's a non-issue. I know people that have gone into arguments over it. They'll see a sheet of music and they'll say, no, this isn't 3-4, this is 6-8. Why try to start an argument that shouldn't even be there in the first place? That all goes into being a good band member, being a, agreeable to a point that's all part of being, having that mentality of there's not just one way to do things. For instance, on drums, you can have, basically when you hit the drum, there's no real way of, of sustaining that longer or shorter than what the drum allows, the overtones of the drums, especially things like toms. So when you hit the snare drum, it's kind of there and gone. If the snare is notated on the music as being a quarter note, but in reality, it only lasts maybe an eighth note or maybe even a 16th note, it doesn't mean that it should be notated as 16th note and then have one two quarter note rests and a 16th note rest if it's just a quarter note or even a half note there's so many different ways of writing a snare hit so not one it, it's, there's just not one right way to do it there's all those different ways of writing the same thing in music and you got to understand that number two practice all the time as i said before it's just like a new language use it or lose it Again, if you take the time to learn, keep on doing it so that you don't lose it because it would be just wasted time. And finally, <laughs> there's this joke that goes, uh, what do you call people that hang out with musicians? Uh, and the answer is drummers, ha ha ha. <laughs> well, if you learn how to read music, you're probably head and shoulders above any other musician because most musicians 
especially in you know rock bands and whatnot most of them don't know how to read music they might be able to read a tab or whatnot most of them definitely can't sight read a good portion of them don't really know how to read at all so if you know how to read music you're you're definitely considered a musician that joke does not apply to you so it's all about combating and uh, diffusing different types and stereotypes and whatnot if you learn how to read music you're at an advantage on every single level and those are my tips and my five reasons why learning how to read music is important not just to musicians who play a musical instrument drums is also are also very musical it's very important that you learn how to read music i think i've actually uh convinced myself to start learning how to read music again what do you guys think have i convinced you how important reading music is let me know in the comments i hope you enjoyed this video i hope you enjoyed the outside i know you can't feel the 72 degrees but it feels amazing let me know what you think of the video again subscribe like if you like check out my website www.kmkendrum.com all the links you ever need are in my description look out for lesson number four i'm going to be doing some uh, exercises for warming up so hopefully you guys tune in for that one as of now have a beautiful day take care thank you for checking it out see ya <laughs> oh and i want to add one more thing i'm doing a giveaway for those of you that don't know this awesome symbol bag is up for grabs all you got to do is go to my website kmcandrum.com just hang out on the home page for about five or six six seconds or so, uh, a little window will pop up asking you to sign up for my mailing list. Do that, and if you haven't already subscribed to my channel, subscribe to the channel. Those are the only two things that you need to do to enter to win this bag. Good luck, and uh, help me build my channel. I really need it. I need the, the, the subscribers. Uh, I don't want to sound too desperate, but I'm pretty desperate. So <laughs> subscribe, sign up to the mailing list, win this bag. Take it easy.